All right, welcome to episode 44 of the Miami Tech Pod. Really excited uh, for this week's episode because we have Rebecca Fishman Lipsy, President and CEO of the Miami Foundation. Rebecca, thank you so much for joining us this week. It's great to be here with you all. Yeah, we're excited to have you. We're going to get into a lot of good stuff because this is a big week for you and the Miami Foundation. So we're going to talk about why such a big week. We're going to talk about Give Miami Week and this whole stuff that's going on. But first, for our listeners that might not know you, can you give us a quick background on you and your background and how you came to Miami and all that good stuff? Sure. So right now I'm running the Miami Foundation, which is the philanthropic backbone for Greater Miami. Before I came here, I had founded a company that I deeply love called Radical Partners. It's an accelerator for social impact ventures. So we would scale both for-profit and nonprofit uh, ventures it based in South Florida that we're trying to solve issues that matter to the future of our community. And uh, before that, I, I came down here because I was running a nonprofit called Teach for America did some time in public service. I taught myself uh, right out of college in New York. And then when I was down here, I served on the Florida Board of Education. So a little bit of policy, a little bit of nonprofit, a little bit of startup stuff, uh, and just totally inspired by what's happening in Miami right now and, and what's happening at the foundation. So when you were at Teach for America, you worked with two of our other guests, I believe, Michelle Abs and Max Tuchman. Is that yeah. correct? Nice. So, yeah. So Max was my... She followed me. She was the executive director right after me uh, and uh, soon to be board member actually over at the foundation. She's a total boss and I, I really admire and love her. And Michelle uh, worked on my team at Teach for America and I visited her when she was teaching in the classroom. She was such a good teacher. And now I, everything that she has done, she has nailed. Uh, she's just such a talented woman. I love them both. So I feel like Teach for America is like such, is a surprisingly great feeder for people in the startup ecosystem, because you know another friend of ours, Weefy, yep. uh, Wefredo Fernandez, was in Teach yeah. for America years ago. Yeah, he was know. in 07. He he's a yeah. cool cat. You know, it's fun. So I think people who join that organization, you know, you're you're often joining right out of college, and you're usually you know it's like they're they're looking for high talent, high enthusiasm, passionate people who care about community, and they want to get you in and passionate about education before you go do all the things you might do in the hopes that then wherever you go, you'll bring with you a passion for equity uh, and a desire to lead in, in that way with what you with what you learned. And a lot of the folks who do the program, they stay in education, uh, but many who don't, you see them then going off to do things where that experience uh, was so formative for them related to inequity in the community. And I see the way it plays out for Max and what she's leading in an ed tech startup that's uh, really focusing on, on literacy and youth and connectivity. And also for Michelle and the work that she does, you know, in the startup scene in Miami, I think equity remains at the forefront for her as well. Totally, totally. So Rebecca, just real quick, maybe to zoom out a little bit, uh, you've seen Miami evolve quite a bit over the past few years. And when I when I think about some of like the core people and core pillars of our ecosystem, you're definitely one of them. You've done such incredible work over the years and you know, truly applaud and respect you for all that. So thank you. Uh, but I'm curious to get your thoughts. How has Miami changed just over the course of the last few years from the, the point where you kind of first got into the Miami tech ecosystem and the entrepreneurial ecosystem to now? Because it's been such a rapid acceleration. Yeah. So first of all, it's nice to hear that from you. I feel that way about all of you. It's it's this feels a bit like an OG reunion of sorts. It's been fun to co-build and to follow your careers and what you're building, um, and then to to have a little reunion and catch up on how things have changed. You know, I think we were all hype people for this city before before it locked in and became true. Uh, and so it's it's fun. I was joking the other day on a panel. You know, if, if ever you've like loved a television show that no one else cared about and then all of a sudden they win all the awards and you're like, I told you that was a good show. I feel like we're having that moment, the like Shit's Creek moment here. Where it's like it's season four and all of a sudden everybody's talking about it. And it's like I was watching. In season one. <laughs> I love uh, that. So we're like the season one crew uh, from Miami, you know, and I say that, but also like this is not the first time. Miami's had a wave of like mass immigration and, and people being excited on a fire. And it happens to be, you know, the previous wave was focused on, um, you know, like housing development um, as, as they're in for us, it's kind of a tech moment. And this won't be the last wave for us either. 
Uh, but it is really fun to see the energy, to see what's building, to see you know people flocking here for opportunity instead of hearing that they need to go somewhere else for that opportunity, seeing the money come here to invest in local startups, knowing that they have promise, uh, seeing what's happening in the, like, the philanthropy scene, which is my zone. You know, people are feeling generous and inspired and it's just, you know, it's a time to be here right now. Seeing, seeing people leave the West Coast to come raise money in Miami. It's hilarious. Like, like the Twilight Zone. You know what I mean? It's crazy. You know, it's funny. Someone told me they were like, well, if all this money and resources come here, like, are we going to like be able to sort of adapt and handle this stuff? And I was I told him, I was like, if there's one thing Miamians know how to do, it's spend other people's money. <laughs> you know? Like we are the greatest absorbers of other people's capital in the history of cities in the last 50 years, you know. Yeah. And so I was like, bring it on. We're used to waves of people coming through, you know, some stay, you know, all of them spend their money locally. You know, that's how our e economy has survived for the last 50 years yeah. and managed to grow. So that's funny, uh, Brian. I mean, it's true, though. I mean, we have been, I guess, to your point, like spending other people's money, like people come here to retire. People come here to vacation. Uh, this has been a place, you know, people flock to for play and for joy. And so it's fun now for this to be a place people flock to for financial opportunity as well. Yeah, I mean, I think it's gonna be really fascinating to see like also the ones who do stay longer than a year, you know, and who like establish roots, you know, like how does that influence their understanding or their view, worldview on like balance of work life and things like that, you know? And totally. that's, you know, there's this myth that I've been trying to dispel for my whole life, which is that Miamians don't work, you know? And the, <laughs> the reality is that like Miamians hustle hard. You know, there's so many people who have multiple jobs. Like I've had like five jobs for the last 20 years. Like, no, like so many different things on my plate. I know Maria and Will have also been consistently with a million things on their plates. You know, no one, no Miamian has one thing that they're focused on, you know? Totally. You know, it's funny. I, so I had that feeling when I, when I moved here years back, so I came from New York, which has a very different work vibe. And I had this feeling like I was working harder, but what I realized is I wasn't investing in the social side of work. The social side of work is very significant here. And so what I thought like excellence looked like in my New York vibe was like more hours in the office in like business meeting structure um, or in like me with computer structure. And what I realized is you get left out of all of the big deals and all of the big opportunities when you're just behind a screen and cranking out like excellent work privately. This is a very social collaborative space. Um, and so I, I invest a lot more time here in networking, like real partnership creation, um, just being out and visible, which I think at first I was very judgy about it. I was like, this is such an events town, like what's happening with all the events. And now I really understand like, no, this is a part of our business culture. This is a very social place. Um, and so I think people who are saying that and judging in that way, they may not get yet how power moves here. Yeah, it's so much of that Latin American like relationship building is so vital to doing business here. It's not very transactional. It's like you ask about people's kids and family life and you kind of get to know them as an individual before you do business with them. And so a lot of that happens kind of outside of these traditional structures. So I completely agree. Yeah, especially, you know, I feel like people in New York create personal space for themselves in public space. Like I'm on a train or I'm in an elevator and like you are literally standing on top of me, but like I will create space for myself. And here we like hug, we kiss on both sides. Like we we really, um, we, you know, and, and I, I think that I remember when I had my first kid and I was on maternity leave and um, pe people wanted to like visit me during my leave and like meet my kids and like, and, and I was like, I'm on vacation right now. And what I really like, I, and then by the time I'd had my second kid, I had acclimated to Miami much more. And like, of course you're gonna be like, why wouldn't you like, we're friends, we're, this is a real relationship. This isn't just a transactional partnership. I feel like that, um, that element of friendship here is so important to the work. Um, and so for all the folks who are tuning in, who are new here, I'd say as much time as you're spending, like building the excellence of your product, your relationships really matter here. They're, they're what's going to open the doors. And so like join in on the, on the party side too. It, it's more work than you realize. You know, that's absolutely true. And like, it, it, it's funny because like in Latin America, like you don't do business with someone you just met, 
right? You need to have like either someone introducing you, there has to be a third party. This is common in Asia too, you know, and it's just like here now, like we've all been, since we're all locals and Rebecca is on the cusp of becoming a, 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 a new native, um, <laughs> You know, and we're she's been here long enough. At. She already is. Right. Um, but like, it's true. It's true that like we've also all become so like inherently skeptical of people we don't know, right? And people because Miami and, and Florida has always had this long history of like sort of con artists who come down like you know and like live up to that shady place or sunny place for shady people moniker, you know. <laughs> um, but like. That's funny. It makes us all a little bit more like our bullshit radar is on uh, is much more fine tuned than in some other communities, you know. But uh, I hear um, that. I hear that, Maria. You were about to ask a question before. No, sorry to 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 add on to what Brian said. Yeah, I think it's like also again to the Latin American culture where you're always a little skeptical of people. It like you know, something sounds too good to be true. So uh, a healthy level of skepticism, I think, works in our favor. Um, no, but I was going to ask, you know, I, I know Refresh and has been a huge beneficiary of the work at Radical Partners. I participated in some of the summits that you hosted uh, in the work previous to Miami Foundation. So would love to hear kind of what led you to start that and kind of the work that you did over the time period that you ran it. And uh, I'm sure it's been bittersweet to, to kind of pass it on, but uh, you're also doing incredible work at the Miami Foundation, but wanted mm -hmm. to take a little bit of time to kind of familiarize people with the work that you did when you started Radical Partners. Yeah, so I remember years back when the entrepreneurial ecosystem was just getting off the ground here. And, you know, Wifi, who was an alum from our program at Teacher Record, was, he like showed me what he was building at Lab. And, and, you know, if you build it, they will come and I'm gonna make this space and people are gonna grow businesses here. And I began to see a lot of energy on the ground here about the future of the entrepreneurial ecosystem and researching who across the country was doing bold work in this space. And thought to myself, you know, so my background was in community impact and community needs. Like this seems like a really cool model for social change. What if I created an accelerator that was focused on growing ventures that mattered to, to issues in our community? You know, I wonder, so a lot of the accelerators, what they do is they find great startups uh, with high potential and they invest early and then hope to get a real financial return as those companies are successful. And I thought, you know, what if my return on investment wasn't cash, it was impact in my community. Let me find leaders who are building something that really matters and I'll invest in them early and help them build their team and their board and their brand um, and their pitch and, and hopefully see them scale. Uh, and so that's exactly what we did. And, and we found you know, corporations in town that really wanted to see this entrepreneurial ecosystem spread out to the social impact space who would sponsor these either for-profit or non-profit social good companies to participate in the program. And they would usually come in when they had like less than $100,000 in revenue a year. And my goal was like, let's get this organization or company to the million dollar mark. Like what will it take to help them grow their team, grow their brand, uh, and bring in a million dollars revenue a year, which to, to me at that time, as I was thinking about it, was like a stable space where like I knew that they were gonna be impacting at scale uh, and the issue that they were focused on. And met through that work, I mean, I cannot believe how many social impact leaders there are in our community building really great things across every issue area. They're here uh, and now they're really, they're growing. You know, it's really interesting, like uh, so how much impact or how people can make impact through their uh, organizations, whether they're nonprofit or for-profit is something that's really been intriguing to me for years. I love the trend and I don't know if this is a new trend or just I'm catching on late, the trend in people building uh, like sustainable business models into their social impact initiatives, you know, yeah. where you're, you're basically using capitalism to do good, right? Because as Maria and I can test, you know, running a nonprofit without a sustainable business model where you're hoping for the next handout, you know, from uh, kind folks like the Give Miami Day event next week where Refresh Miami is a recipient uh, or participant, I should say. But it's tough to like build a long-term sustainable organization when there isn't the traditional revenue generators or, or whatnot are hard to access, you know, and like, totally. and, I, and seeing people apply this, uh, these proven business models to impact is to me is that like, we're at the first steps or the first innings of this new game. 
Yeah. Totally. And it was fun for me, you know, like I, I was totally agnostic as an accelerator about whether you were for profit or nonprofit in structure, like that's your choice. But I want to teach you how to build revenue into your model and donations into your model. Like for profits can receive donations depending on the type of work that they're doing and who they partner with and, and nonprofits can have revenue. And so teaching people how to play, like how to build your social impact work uh, and not constantly be waiting for a handout. Um, or a donation or for someone else's kind of philanthropic goodwill in order to sustain the thing that you do. You know, so I see like, for example, for Refresh, you have this massive audience uh, that is eating up your content. Like how do you build revenue off of that? So that it's like part of your model is not just constantly looking for grants uh, and, and there'll be people who will give it because they see the good that you're doing in the community, but, but your audience, how do you get them to buy in and, and sustain you through the value of what you create. And every nonprofit should be finding ways to sustain their value in that way. I wanna talk a little bit and shine a light on the Miami Foundation, because we have a big day coming up. Uh, for our listeners that don't know much about the organization, can you just tell us at a high level what the Miami Foundation is and its focus? Sure, so anyone who's listening in who does not yet know the Miami Foundation, go to our website, miamifoundation.org, uh, and, and get involved in our work. So we are the foundation for Greater Miami. Uh, our intention is a stronger, more equitable Miami, and to basically inspire everyone who lives here and works here and plays here to get involved in their community, to give back in their community, whether that's through their time or through their resources, we house and grow philanthropic assets for the community. So in short, I am like a bank that is can completely dedicated to philanthropy. So it's no joke, Brian. So we have more than $400 million in assets that we invest in the market. And then based on the returns of those investments, I can give to nonprofits in our community each year. Uh, and last year we gave out I mean, tens of millions of dollars to our community based on that growth of our assets. And so we're not just kind of bringing in donations and spending them each year. We bring in donations and we grow those assets every year. Uh, and then we also look to see who's doing what in the community, what are the greatest trends, what are the greatest needs? And we steer people to make investments in the community in as strategic a way as possible. So I'll give you an example. I'm sure we'll talk more about this later, um, but like the digital divide was a huge issue uh, in the face of COVID, kids were sent home from school, you know, and, and they, they couldn't attend school if they didn't have access to the internet at home. Uh, and, and we thought, you know, how do we get internet for every single kid? Well, you know, there's lots of people who want to donate to that, but if it's not coordinated, we won't, we won't know which families have and which families don't and which neighborhoods have and which don't. We said like, we need a quarterback here. We're going to raise money centrally. We're going to make a master plan for how this works. And so like, we will find issues like that, plant a flag, and say, you know, everyone in Miami, this is an issue that matters. Give to this. We're going to coordinate a response for the community. We did that for COVID. We did that after the Surfside building collapsed. Um, and for every year, we pick a handful of issues where we really go deep. And then we grow those assets for the community and invest them, hopefully, as strategically as possible every year. It's super important because there's so many things going on around the city. It's great to have the Miami Foundation to coordinate all these different initiatives and really shine a light on what matters most. Uh, so with that being said, Give Miami Day is coming up. Can we talk a little bit about Give Miami Day? First of all, yes. how does that day come to be, right? And then let's talk about what it stands for, when it is, and how folks can get involved. Yeah, so this is the 10th anniversary. This has been going on for a decade. Uh, it was brought to our community by my predecessor, Javier Soto, I think on a dare from the Knight Foundation, which is good fun. Uh, they, were, they were sitting over coffee uh, and talking about how uh, this was happening in other communities and could we do this here in Miami? And I think Javier had like won a free website in like a drawing and was like, you know what, I could use this uh, if I had some seed funding. And so this this started a decade ago uh, with, with two boys over coffee. And um, it started, I think that year, the goal was raise a half a million dollars and they, they ended up raising a million over that first year. Last year at the ninth year, we raised $18 million over the course of a day for Miami's nonprofits. So in short, what this is, like this is the day of generosity in Miami. We invite every nonprofit to participate in our community. This year we have over 900 nonprofits participating and we create the digital infrastructure so that it is free uh, for all nonprofits to participate. We spread the word, we get every newspaper talking about it. We try to rally in as many companies as possible to do corporate giving on that day. And we say, find your cause and donate. We wanna see tens of thousands of donations coming in over the course of the day. And then we build a, a match pool to create incentives and prizes throughout the day so that it's just like full of energy. Uh, and our hope is that at the end of this year, 
if we ra if we hit our goal this year, we will have raised a hundred million dollars for Miami's nonprofits on this day, which is really exciting. That's incredible. I remember last year's. Last year's was 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 pretty epic too, because it was right smack dab, kind of in the middle of COVID. It was right before all the the Miami craziness kicked off. Yeah. You know I mean, so I'm really looking forward to seeing what happens this year, because this is the first Give Miami Day after all you know new folks are in town, and be curious to see. I particularly remember last year. There was one of your teammates after because it was such a big day. I forgot how the exact amount of how much money you guys raised, but there was a guy singing on your Zoom call, right? It was like a <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know. It was just a really cool moment in general. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. It, you know, it's it's so celebratory and it's so like it's such a unifying feeling. Um, and I agree with you. You know, I think everyone is kind of paying attention. They want to yeah. know who's going to step up. We have so many people who have made a big splash, buying a big expensive place, moving to Miami. And I think all of the locals are are paying attention and want to see. So is your company going to step up on this day? Are you going to create a match on this day? Are you going to give? Um, and I just I, I I'm kind of I'm kind of moved uh, myself. I'm getting calls around the clock from people who want to be getting involved, trying to figure out which cause to to tie to, and I think it's going to be a really special day. It's this Thursday already. If you want to give, you can you can already go online and give um, in early giving. But it's this Thursday, um, and I, I hope it's going to be big. So I think one of the big questions a lot of these transplants to Miami uh, are going to have with regards to Give Miami Day is. Can I donate crypto assets to give yeah. Miami Day? So that's so funny. So we actually just at our quarter four board meeting, we just approved our cryptocurrency policy. And so for the first time, we opened up our Coinbase account. We created our procedures for doing it. So we'll be able to accept Bitcoin and Ethereum by the end of the year. Um, look at you. Um, but we, we don't... Um, for Give Miami Day, we don't have it set up for this year, but I bet by next year we'll be able to do it because we just approved the policy. I want, I want to see a Miami Foundation NFT. You yeah, know? I would like to see that too. 305 flamingos, you know, and let's get this rocking. You know, it's funny, Will. So we're on the third floor of our building. So we and we're the only ones here on the third floor. It's a small third floor, mm -hmm. um, but we call ours it's Sweet 305 because because Miami. Uh, so I agree. I feel like we need a 305 NFT for the foundation that gives back in that way. 100%. Do you want to just, I just off again, it's, it's not fair to pick a favorite child here, but just some of the organizations that are, you know, that you can donate for on Give Miami Day, some notable ones top of mind that we could just yeah. share. So I know, I know you're going to hate me not answering. I feel like I'm not allowed to have a favorite child, yeah. um, but, but I'll say this, like anyone who's tuning in, you need to find a cause that you care about. So every hour on the hour, there's a different issue area that we'll be focusing on and you can sort for different things. So I really care about equity in my giving. So I love to sort and learn about like who's leading this organization, what neighborhoods are being represented. Um, you know, I, I like to look for minority leaders and female led companies and, um, and I really care about LGBTQ rights. And so I look to make sure that those organizations are raising funds on that day. You can also sort to see who's already raised funds and who hasn't. And I love to look at the bottom and see who hasn't brought in resources yet and make sure that everybody, um, you know, everyone walks away from the day whole. Um, but what I, you know, what I would encourage is like, look through each hour, whether it's education or access to jobs and opportunities or health, you know, you can, you can sort for that. You can find all the organizations and don't just give to the ones you have heard of, like look and discover organizations that are doing things in your community that you believe in that you haven't spotted yet. Like, I think that's part of the magic of the day is to find, find people, uh, and, and invest early and, and really show your care for the issue you care about. And Rebecca, outside of Give Miami Day, I know you all kind of issue challenges throughout the year. Are there any challenges coming up that you want to kind of give folks a heads up about? Yeah. So, I mean, the one that I've been really passionate about this past year is our racial equity fund. We've really been thinking, and I, I'm thinking about this in my for-profit investments and also in my nonprofit investments, like thinking through who you are giving resources to and helping to grow and, and where you might have blind spots in your giving. Uh, and so we launched the racial equity fund in 2020 and we've given four rounds of investments from that fund. I'm really passionate about it and hoping that, you know, I, I saw Miami really step up and rally related to race and equity uh, in their giving and their investing. And I just want to make sure that that's not something that happened once. And then we focus on the next thing. I want to see sustained momentum on that. And so I'd really encourage people uh, to give to that fund and to get involved. I would also say, you know, like COVID recovery is not done. 
uh, for many of the organizations that are doing, you know, food rescue um, and, and helping people to upscope and get jobs in, in, in a new economy, like the needs are sustained. Uh, and so our COVID recovery fund, I would say, is still something that's a major priority for me. And then Miami Connected, especially for people who are tuning in here, Miami Connected is something that I'm really focused on, which is like close the digital divide, internet access, like broadband for all, um, and internet access in the house and digital literacy for every kid, for every family uh, in our community. Those are some of my some of my passion areas this year. You know, I, I think that's such a good point and topic that you guys brought up of like how do how do we sustain the charitable giving and the impact throughout the year because i know so many people they do all their donations on one day of the year right you know yeah. and they don't like spread it out throughout the year and they you know there isn't st strategic thinking to this you know um for the average person and i, I love i i think it's awesome that you guys are doing all these challenges throughout the year and there's and it's keeping it top of mind for folks. You know, I think that's the big key, you know, and um, Miami, you know, it's funny, like a lot of the folks who moved here sort of came here and they're like, Miami is this oasis of paradise, you know, uh, like compared to wherever they were coming from. And like Miami has its own problems, as we all know, you know, Miami is not this, uh, you know, sterile environment of without its, you know, issues. But I think it's, it's tough to also expose in a uh, intentional way the newcomers to these issues, you know, like, yeah. you know, like we also have homelessness as an issue, you know, we also have drug abuse. We also have like petty crime and serious major crimes and all these other things, you know, Yeah. but I'm curious to your thoughts on like, how do you introduce that these issues to someone who's new to the community, but not in a way of like, well, you're here now, fix this for us. Right. Because right. we've been working on fixing these things for years, you know, yeah, but it's yeah. more of a, you know, you're here now, this is what we're working on. We'd love your help. You know? Totally. And I would say, I mean, I've seen in the social impact space, like issues that really matter here that we've really taken on over mm -hmm. the last decade. And, and we will continue, I think, hopefully leading our country. I think the environment is a huge area where we, we, we need to lead this country. Homelessness was a massive issue. 20, 30 years ago. And I think over the course of COVID, what became the issue, the subset within homelessness, uh, where we actually, we, we did a pretty good job over the course of COVID, making sure people who were on the cusp of becoming homeless uh, didn't fall into insufficiency, uh, but it was actually the elderly that were at the greatest risk of becoming homeless and being evicted at the end. And so, you know, there's a lot of things I've seen the community step up to do, but, you know, for newbies who are here who wanna be socially aware about what's going on. My favorite thing to share with people is the Alice Report, which is something the United Way produces. It's a report that comes out every two years um, about, so Alice stands for Asset Limited Income Constrained Employed. So this is the population in Miami that is employed. They are working and they are still asset limited and income constrained. Like they don't have resources. On average, they'll say, you know, they have like $400 in savings. Well, what happens when your work is closed for a week for a hurricane? You know, you literally, you know, you're blowing through your entire safety net. And so helping people understand the volume of our population that fits into that group, I think is really important because there is so much visible wealth here that you can think that all of Miami is a state of like asset richness um, and income richness. And actually it's about 50%, like let's say 47% this year of the population that's either living at the poverty line or that's in this Alice subset where they're working, but they only have a couple hundred dollars in savings. And I think people's awareness of that, like to be sensitive that like half of the population is living in a state of that kind of anxiety, I think is a really important thing for a newbie. And one thing I like about, I, I guess the sense that I get in Miami is, yes, we have these challenges, but I feel like the people in the ecosystem feel empowered to do something about it. You they are. kind of feel like I'm going to take up that cause and I'm going to do something about it. And it's not like you feel completely kind of you, helpless with it. You're kind of empowered to try to do something about it, which I, I, I haven't necessarily seen in a lot of other communities. I totally see that. I totally see that, Maria. I, I really feel this is a really innovative city. And I see people innovating both on the for-profit side and on the nonprofit side and on the volunteer side, like to to see an issue and then to innovate around it. Uh, this is not like a stagnant city that turns a blind eye 
to pain. I think we talk, we talk about it. And I think because this is a city people have fled to from so many other places, now we're seeing people flee from, uh, you know, from, from the Bay Area uh, coming over here. But, but like, we have people who are refugees from all over who have come here, they want to be here. And they, we, I think we understand what it is to rebuild um, and to you know, face challenges. And we have a respect uh, for, for people who are experiencing pain that I think is really special to the city. Awesome. No, I completely agree. And I think with that, it become a great point to mention a call to action for folks that are listening because we need everybody's help, right? There are a lot of mm -hmm. people that are coming uh, to the city. A lot of people say, you know, want to be in Miami. How can I help? How can I get involved? Well, here's a great way to get started with the Miami Foundation. Give Miami Day. You want yeah. a community, you want to have an impact. How could folks get involved? How do, how do they, they get started? Just go to the Miami Foundation website. You're the best. So this week, so generally, yes, please come check out the site, find things that you care about. But this week, this is like the gateway drug for getting involved in Miami. Yes. If you want to get involved in Miami, this is your week. It's Give Miami Day. It's on Thursday. Go to the site, givemiamiday.org, givemiamiday.org. Mm -hmm. um, and you will find every organization that is doing something that matters. You can search by topic. You can search by neighborhood. You can search by leader. Um, and you should find your cause and give. Give Miami Day. If be one of the cool kids there, you know, everyone who is in Miami is being charged to step up, find their cause and give. And if you're new here and you want to get involved, this is your moment. I love that. We'll make sure to drop all of the links to the Miami Foundation and Forgive Miami Day in the description. So folks awesome. can easily click. Um, yeah, a call to action for sure. So many people want to get involved. Again, the slogan for the Miami tech ecosystem is how can I help? Here's some yes. get started right away get involved find your cause as rebecca is saying there's so many great ones out there uh and yeah participate in, in what should be a great day uh on november 18th yes um, so, awesome y'all yeah. are the best thank you for hosting me thank you for doing what you do of course rebecca fishman lipsy one of the shining stars in the miami tech community one of the pillars of the miami tech community thank you so much for all your work for everything you do for the city and thank you for joining the podcast today you got it